I've pretty much since Apple II's existed been interested in playing games. So since I was a kid, I've known that either I wanted to run a candy factory, because Willy Wonka was my favorite uh, movie growing up, or run a game shop. So that was sort of the inception of the idea. I had no idea that uh, this was all going to turn into Blizzard. I just thought making games would be fun. and. Managed to talk a couple of cool guys in college into uh, into coming on board, and here, you know, we are 20 years later. I met Alan, uh, actually, my last year at UCLA. I noticed that there was this guy in both of my classes, and there was one day Alan and I both showed up early uh, to the computer architecture class, and I saw him, and I thought I'd be really smart, because I thought he looked Israeli. I said, so where in Israel are you from? And he looked at me kind of, puzzled. He said, what? I said, where are you from? And he said, oh, I'm from Egypt. I don't remember that, but that's the one Mike tells. The one I remember is we were sitting side by side at UCLA in one of the computer labs, and uh, I had gotten up to go get a cup of coffee, go to the bathroom, and I had locked my computer system. And when I came back, I sat down, I typed in my password, the system unlocked, and I kept working. And this guy sitting next to me, who I didn't know, was Mike, turned to me and he said, hey, how'd you do that? And I said, um, do what? He said, while you were gone, your system unlocked itself and I relocked it using my password. And so it turned out, and what are the chances, Mike and I were both using the same password to lock our, uh, our computer systems. He graduated slightly before me about um, three months, maybe six months, but he kind of knew what the plan was, and uh, he was down here in Irvine working at Western Digital. He got in his head that I should quit my job at Western Digital and go into business with him making games. Much to the chagrin of his uh, parents, his father in particular thought it was crazy to leave uh, a good job for this crazy startup with a 22-year-old kid, but I think uh, his dad knows he made the right decision now. I borrowed uh, $15,000 from my grandmother uh, $10,000 went into the company, $5,000 went into my bank account, and that's pretty much what I lived off of for the next two years. Frank is a similar story. We were also both in the computer science department. I attended UCLA to study computer science and engineering, and while I was there, I was fortunate enough to meet Alan Adham through a mutual acquaintance. We had a, an AI class together, artificial intelligence, and it was so boring. It was so boring that I used to ditch all the time, and I'd go to Ackerman Union at UCLA and play video games. I would always see the same guy there. He had the same AI class. I think we saw each other like the first day and maybe on test days, and that was about it, because we were both always ditching and playing video games. When I was growing up, I always felt like I wanted to make computer games, but I really had no idea how to go about doing it. Um, Alan also knew that he wanted to make computer games, but he knew exactly how he wanted to go about doing it. And right after Alan graduated, uh, we happened to chat on the phone, and he said, Frank, I want to talk to you about, about what I'm doing next. I want you to be a part of it, and he invited me to, to come make computer games with him. Uh, I left my job at Rockwell, and I came to, to work with Alan, and that was actually the first time I met Mike Morheim was the first day. We uh, built desks together. That was our first day. It was a very small space, about 600 square feet, and right out the gate we started working on ports of uh, Amiga and Mac titles, um, which was actually really great exposure for us because having never authored code for a computer game before, this gave us a huge code base to look at. There was this attitude that it didn't matter what our project was, we were going to learn how to do it, and we could learn anything that we set our minds to. Initially, uh, we were called Silicon and Synapse. Silicon, the building block of the computer, and Synapse, the building block of the human mind. Computers, brains, creativity, technology, nobody got it. What we actually got over the phone was, silicone, isn't that what you put in women's breast implants? And what the hell is a Synapse? You know, when we first started, we just had this idea that we were looking for smart, passionate people who loved games, loved uh, learning about game development. We just wanted to make great games. It was really as simple as that. Our biggest criteria was we wanted kind of cool people who we thought would vibe with the company who played video games, and that applied to everybody. 
I think that sort of the pre-Warcraft orcs and humans era of Blizzard um, really allowed us to grow um, the talent pool at the company. We hired our first 3D artist. His name was Joey Ray Hall. <sighs> our early hires in, in the art group were like, I think uh, Sam came in, Sam Wise. I saw an ad in the newspaper. It said, make art for video games. And that was all it said, really descriptive. I think a programmer wrote it. Computer programming, we just wanted guys who were really into games and really into computer coding. Bob came in, he was obviously a D&D geek and an excellent programmer. I walk in in my uh, I love toxic waste t-shirt with a Tasmanian devil on the front, shorts and a t-shirt, sandals. And uh, apparently it struck a chord with the three guys there. So I came in uh, for the interview, and the first thing I saw was this cute little receptionist uh, named Frank Pierce. At the time they had me answering the phones, um, and honestly, I don't think I'm the best person to be answering the phones because I don't always have the most pleasant personality. He opened up his mouth and said, yeah, can I help you? And I said, yeah, I'm here to see Alan Atham. And he said, well, Alan's on a meeting. Can you go out talk to Mike? <laughs> And so I met with Mike. I had my portfolio of art, which basically consisted of every single piece of art I had framed on the wall. I just threw into a big uh, case, brought it in. And after that, he showed it to Alan, and they offered me the job there. They hired me to work on rock and roll racing. Written for the Super Nintendo. Uh, it was a, a new version of RPM racing that the company had done as one of their first startup games. And we were, I think, the first American developer to uh, develop and release a title for the Super Famicom. And we did it, we literally were using untranslated Japanese documents. Rock and roll racing? I didn't work on that. Uh, when I started, it was just sort of a normal racing game and very much just a evolution of the RPM racing we had been doing. It was also kind of funny because we knew that race car games should have cool driving music. And before rock and roll racing, nobody had really used rock music at all. So I programmed rock and roll racing using assembly language for a 6502 processor. Hemi, hemi, hemi. We added uh, spaceships and space aliens and all sorts of laser car sort of stuff. And we just kind of evolved it into a little bit cooler style of a, a game again some of the Blizzard influence developing there, where instead of doing the normal cars, we made rocket cars with lasers and guns and that kind of stuff. And that, plus the fact that it was an excellent game, Rock and Roll Racing took uh, Racing Game of the Year that year. So the, the first uh, SNES title that I worked on in earnest was uh, Lost Vikings, and we had almost everyone in the office working on that project. When I started on Lost Vikings, there were about a hundred Vikings you could control. Some that would raise up ladders, someone that would throw torches, all that sort of thing. It was very uh, PC game oriented. We were sort of inspired by uh, Lemmings, a little PC game where you had a ton of little guys and they would just kind of walk around the screen. And so we decided to make it a little bit more friendly for the Super Nintendo and we dropped it down to five characters, then to four, then to three. But it also had a lot of puzzles and a lot of level design and a lot more creative stuff that we were putting into it than we had needed to, I would say, previously. For Lost Vikings, what I, I was responsible for doing all the layouts for all of the um, puzzles and all the, the levels within Lost Vikings. We used a program called CED that Mike Morheim had written for this purpose to lay things out. CED, the cell editor. This was my first project at, uh, at Blizzard. It was a C++ uh, project written uh, completely in uh, Zortec C++ and uh, learned how to program in C++. It was also the, the first forerunner for the uh, map editor that would later become part of StarCraft and WarCraft and um, our, our games moving forward. That's kind of our first move of taking sort of PC style artwork and bringing it more into the Blizzard art style where it's a little bit more cartoony, it's a little bit more accessible to the console market. It went on to win uh, Puzzle Game of the Year in the same year that Rock and Roll Racing won Racing Game of the Year. And so our tiny little company with about 20 employees won two, I think, of the top seven awards that year. Keeping in mind, we were competing against companies like 
Sega and Nintendo and Konami and Capcom, I think we may have been the only company to win two of the seven top awards. I was the lead, lead, lead programming guy on, uh, on Blackthorn, which was uh, one of the few games that we've done over the years that didn't actually have a multiplayer component to it. It was inspired by a couple of cool games that at the time we thought were really fun, kind of blends between, uh, you know, puzzle games and shooters. Blackthorn was actually our first uh, rotoscope game. We actually took Frank Pierce out in the back alley and um, got him to jump over a bunch of wood and got him to run and, and climb ladders and things like that, and we'd videotape him. Then we'd come back in and, and we'd draw over him for the character. It was a little bit dry and a little bit boring, so we ended up making it on some far off planet, and for some reason this guy with the dirty t-shirt and jeans is a prince, and like all princes, they have shotguns. It was a pretty quick development. I don't remember it taking very long. When I think back on Blackthorn, the funny thing I think about it is that the two artists that were primarily responsible for creating the character art for Blackthorn uh, both had long, stringy hair. And if you look at all the character art in Blackthorn, including the main character, they've got this long, stringy hair. And it's like, wow, these artists basically created this character art in their own image. And so I think we need more diversity among our artists working on any one project so that we get diversity in that character art. I guess the other funny story to go along with that was we had to change the name in Europe from Blackthorn to Black Hawk. Uh, Blackthorn turns out to be a really popular brand of beer in Europe. So it'd be like, I guess, if we had named our product Budweiser. In the early years, uh, the company pretty much lived on royalties that we got from the games we worked on or the ports that we worked on. But there were times when, when there just wasn't enough money to pay salaries and stuff like that. On paper, it always looked like we were just a couple months away from being completely in the black and having a windfall of, um, of excess cash to work with, and it never really happened. Mike and I tried to, you know, shelter everybody from anything other than making the games. We found out that you could actually get interest-free advances on your discovery card by uh, going to the supermarket and getting um, cash back. They would go and they would cash in their credit cards at the local market and then put the money in the bank account so that they could still make payroll. And although we never missed the payroll, it's really a miracle that we never missed the payroll because we were always a week away from being unable to uh, to make payroll. And some people knew about this and some people didn't. And and it, but those of us that did, we we know the kind of people these men are, and we knew then that we would work for these people forever. And so it was a pretty lean uh, couple of years early on, but amazingly still super super fun. The company sort of grew beyond the point where our Discover cards couldn't handle it anymore. So we each went to our parents and we got them to put each $20,000 into a bank account, so $40,000. And um, at the time that um, we sold the company to Davidson and Associates, we completely maxed out the $40,000 credit, credit line. And so, yeah, I mean, it was pretty tight for the first few years. So that was a period where we were transitioning from being a third-party developer, where we would make products for other companies based on their ideas. The next step up was being sort of a joint developer, where we would take our own concepts and, uh, and pitch them, like Lost Vikings. And then we decided we wanted to try self-publishing, and we had started um, with Warcraft. The idea there was that it would still be published by an established publisher who had distribution, but we would control the packaging, we would sort of control the marketing, and our name would go on the front of the box. In the middle of that process, Bob and Jan Davidson came along. Uh, we became aware of silicone and, silicone and Synapse because we had a product called Kidworks, which needed to be transformed into Windows. And they took on the project, they did it, on budget, on time. I heard about Silicon and Synapse when I started at Davidson and Associates. And interestingly enough, when I arrived, the first thing that I was asked to do was do contractual due diligence to acquire this little company that Davidson was looking at. Our interest in buying them came because we had achieved a larger and larger market share of the educational software market. And a larger business, much larger, was the entertainment side of uh, PC software. One night, Bob just said to Alan, he goes, how much do you want? And Alan gave him an astronomical amount and thinking that Bob would just go, no way, that's way too much. And Bob said, yes, 
we were a public company at the time, I believe, and so uh, uh, we had, you know, we had the wherewithal to, to do that. But we didn't know if they had an interest in selling, but I guess Interplay uh, made them an offer or approached them about um, acquiring more of them. Interplay back in those days uh, was the cream of the crop. They were an excellent company and uh, had a lot of really, really good people. We always thought, well, Interplay had a bit of advantage because they, you know, they were culturally aligned with, uh, with the folks at Silicon and Synapse. Uh, on the other hand, we were adults. <laughs> and uh, one of the things they were looking for was adults to do the business side of the business. They basically said, nothing has to change. You guys continue doing just what you're doing now. You guys are really good at making games. We're really good at educational software. We'll handle the sales and distribution for you, but nothing has to change. Keep, keep doing what you're doing. These guys are creative and you can't control you know, creative talent. You've got to let it do what it's gonna do. And I said, they're more than creative. They understand their consumers. They are their consumers. Finally, on a Friday, Alan called me and said, you know, your company's really very attractive, but you know, we've been doing business with Interplay for quite a while, and uh, we think we're gonna go that direction. And uh, Jan came in my office a little while later, and I said, well, the, the guys down at Silicon and Synapse have decided to go to Interplay. She said, really, can I talk to Alan? I said, be my guest. <laughs> and. Uh, she did, so I'll let her describe that conversation. Well, I called him up and I said, you have made a big mistake. And he said, well, you know, we've been sitting on the floor and we were thinking that we may have done the worst thing we've ever done to ourselves. And I said, you've made a big mistake and I want you to think about it some more. The following Monday, Alan uh, called me and he said, I've been thinking about what Jan has said all weekend, and I didn't get a minute's sleep. And I'm thinking, that's pretty good. <laughs> and uh, so I finally said, you know, we really want adults, we really want the business acumen that we see with the folks at uh, Davidson. And he said, we're gonna change our mind, we'll go with you. They said that we would be able to completely retain our creative control over the games we were making, and um, that has managed to uh, allow us to protect our autonomy all of these years. And I think we've got a, a setup that is totally unique in terms of divisions of uh, larger organizations having this time, type of autonomy. It wasn't hard for us to, to uh, allow Blizzard to do its thing, but there was always a little caveat. As long as it was working, <laughs> you know, if it's not working, uh, we might have to do something, but it always worked. Uh, there wasn't a time when it didn't work. Well, I think any name change for our company was uh, was was destined to be better than Silicon and Synapse. Uh, at some point, Alan decided um, we sh we need to change our name. So there was this sort of brainstorming effort, and we wound up with Chaos Studios, which we felt was pretty representative of our development process, which I'm told is still pretty representative of our development process. A lot of people thought it said Chaos or Chads. And then we got a phone call from a company called T Chaos Technologies. They're based out in Florida, and they basically said, hey, we have the name Chaos, but we're happy to let you continue using it, but it will cost you $100,000. And we said, ooh, okay, no thanks, we'll pick a different name. One of the first things that happened after the acquisition was Alan calls and said, well, we had a big meeting and we don't like the, the name Chaos anymore, we want to change it. So we were going through some other ideas and then we had an idea for Ogre Studios. Well, at the time, we were already um, part of Davidson and Associates, and when Alan presented the new name Ogre Studios to Jan Davidson, she hated it. I said, oh, hmm, that's interesting. Can I get back to you on that? So uh, I had a little chat with Jan, and uh, she had kind of an initial, you know, thump. <laughs> um, thought that the name might be a little scary for the kids. I called Alan back, and I said, you know, I did promise you that you'd have your own independence, and this is kind of embarrassing, but this does seem to have some impact, uh, according to Jan and our marketing folks, and they know better than I, on, on our business. Uh, so we ended up changing that name as well to something a little bit more friendly. 
And I think the way we figured it out was Alan came in one weekend with seven words he picked out of the dictionary. Midnight Studios was one, which sort of sounds like a porn company, maybe. And uh, Blizzard Entertainment, which came up clean. And th thankfully, we navigated all of those mediocre and sometimes bad names and wound up with a really awesome name like Blizzard. We went from boobies to ogres to chads to Blizzard. I remember, this was hundreds of years ago, uh, a chap by the name of Chris Metzen came in and he, he walked into my office. Alan was showing him around and he noticed that I had a lot of D&D stuff on the walls and so he and I were immediately uh, connected there, geeks. I was uh, playing with a band many years ago and um, at one of the gigs we were doing, uh, I, I guess I was drawing on a, on a cocktail napkin or something. A friend of a friend came by and saw it and, and uh, said, hey, you know, there's this place down in Costa Mesa hiring for artists. And I, I didn't really know what the place was. I thought it was like some kind of graphic arts firm. But at the time I figured, hey, you know, if they're gonna pay me to draw, uh, that sounds pretty good. And uh, I rolled down on a, I don't know, Friday morning and I uh, met a very charming man called Joey Ray. I think his first words out of his mouth were, you know, what the hell do you want? Some of the times we weren't exactly the most pleasant people to be talking to. We would um, answer phones like, what? And Alan would come out and yell at us and say, you can't answer the phone that way, guys. I'm like, okay, fine, you know. And I put, uh, you know, some of my drawings down on the desk and uh, he went and got the, the boss, a guy named Alan Adham. And uh, he invited me back. We talked for a little bit and uh, he asked me if I wanted a job and I told him that I would sweep his floors. You know, I just knew that the, the place I'd walked into and all the people that I met that day, like that was, you know, it was, it was home. It was basically back in the day, a lot of geeks playing a lot of different games and listening to heavy metal and rock and roll and all that. There were a lot of shenanigans. Um, you know, a bunch of yahoos running around, you know, running around with Nerf guns and... Nobody knows how the Jawa wall came to be. One day someone got a hold of like a, a little yellow block of post-it notes. And uh, I don't remember who, who drew it first, but you know, he drew like a, like a Jawa. And like, ha it's funny, Jawa. People started screwing with the integrity of the Jawa name. All these artists are drawn, uh, you know, we had one that was, uh, had this particularly big afro and these big glasses, and he was just, you know, very, very angry flipping the bird, and that was Jawa Ray Hall, right? That was pretty funny. And mixing it up with classic heroes like uh, Jawa and Wayne. Joe Optimus Prime, you know, a big Jawa chasing a Jeep, that was, you know, Jurassic Park. From Samurai Showdown, Jawan Fu. You know, like a guitarist smashing a Jawa with his foot, which was the Jawa pedal. The whole wall was filled with it, and then, Days later, it was gone. It was like a shadow of a memory. And I still look back to those days with longing, but alas, they are no more. Thanks, HR. We had been making a lot of games for the console and everything, you know, we had kind of pushed to a little, be a little bit more thicker and chunkier. The first thing I worked on for Blizzard was um, Justice League Task Force. It was a, like a Street Fighter type game we were doing with superheroes, which just lit me up like a Christmas tree. This game was, was special because we learned a, a very valuable lesson in this, that Superman, no matter what you've seen, cannot kick. I moved on. I think they tried me out on tile sets for Lost Vikings 2. I started with Blizzard in 94, and uh, I was quickly put into a bullpen with Mickey Nielsen, Dave Berger, and Chris Metzen. Uh, I didn't really know uh, Metzen at the time. I remember we were all just starting to learn 3D, and it was it was a pain in the butt because we'd all come from a very traditional background, artistic background. All the artists were transitioning over to uh, 3D Max. You know, the whole industry's going 3D. I remember being very uh, intimidated by the program. So I'm like, oh no, like, I, I hope I can keep this job. I don't think I'm gonna be able to do this. I remember Chris cussing, I'm like, oh, that guy's cussing. I'm like, I don't know if they allow that in the workplace. And I remember just hearing him pull back and just <clears throat> I wound up, uh, I think, spitting on my screen in frustration. I look over, I'm like, dude, that guy's getting fired. And I remember for like the next week, every time I'd come in, I'm like, how is he still here? How did that, how did that guy not get fired? In those days, we wore a lot of hats. Uh, everyone wore a lot of hats. You had your set job, like in my case, it was doing art or stuff like that, but I also was a receptionist. We also did all QA ourselves. We also did all tech support ourselves. I was one of two people that was in charge of tech support. Um, so we would basically take telephone calls during the day, tech support calls during the day. And then in the evening, we'd go to Fry's or Micro Center or whatever and pick up hard
hardware to come install on people's computers. So we did a lot of stuff. Any time that you could do more than one thing, it was always appreciated, and we always just jumped in. That's the way we were. You'd have artists working on Death and Return of Superman one day, then working on Justice League Task Force the next day, and then starting up this new little game, I don't know, what is it called? Warcraft. <laughs> At the time, a lot of us really, uh, really liked Dune 2, uh, the game from Westwood Studios. But we were the first company, apart from Westwood, to recognize the value of the RTS genre. The evolution of the Warcraft universe is probably a very awkward process. Most of its ideas were just this kind of amalgamation of, of the different designers and people working on it at the time. It was pretty, pretty classic stuff, pretty classic fantasy stuff. So we were making characters, orcs and humans and all this sort of thing, but they just look kind of small and, and realistic and kind of doink. One of the reasons was because they were small and doink. Sam Didier and, you know, certainly the other, you know, lead artists kind of got involved. The idea of, of creating um, kind of these interlocked ideas or cultures really allowed um, these guys to have a springboard into the, the art design process. That was our attempt at doing something that was a little bit more fun and fast and fantasy, but not boring medieval fantasy with little doinky swords and guys with little chainmail hoods. Nah, we had cool stuff like orcs with horns coming out of the sides of their helmet and all kinds of teeth and dwarves and all that. Warcraft 1 was such a hit that Blizzard really became a known developer. Uh, everybody in the industry went wow, and became game of the year, uh, and that raised a lot of eyebrows. And uh, the second year, they weren't any longer the new kid on the block. Around the time that we started jamming Warcraft 2, um, I remember feeling very intensely that, like, wouldn't it be fun to, to blow this thing out, really, to have multiple kingdoms and continents and, you know, more races involved, each with their own kind of distinct uh, flavor and history. Uh, ultimately, th there were many years between, you know, Warcraft 2 and Warcraft 3. We had cut our teeth on a, a few other, you know, game types or universes that allowed us to grow and, and, and really get our, like, storytelling values in line. So by the time Warcraft 3 really came about, uh, we were ready to attack that thing. We knew who we were as artists. We knew who we were as storytellers. And the ideas came um, much freer um, and much clearer. And it definitely had heart. The cinematics were fantastic. I, in some ways, still feel like those cinematics were the high watermark for the industry. And I think it'll just continue. I think, you know, we see over the next 10 or 20 years as this sort of artistic ceiling uh, on what we can do real time continues to rise. It was also uh, a very important project for me because I wanted to really define the art style uh, for Blizzard. It was uh, probably one of the first times that me and uh, Metzen really worked, focused very closely together on the storytelling. Uh, I'd set the bar pretty high in my mind and to achieve that, it took a lot of late nights. Cinematics department actually I guess the seeds of that started way back during the development of Warcraft Orcs and Humans. I think we had one person in the cinematics department, that was Joey Ray Hall. I was the original uh, cinematics uh, person at all in Blizzard Entertainment because I had 3D experience. He created these sort of by today's standards, um, very rudimentary looking 3D zoom-ins on the map. By War II, we had started building up a lot more uh, 3D stuff and, and bringing in more people. Before I started at Blizzard, I was going pre-med, and a buddy of mine was working at Blizzard and kept telling me, you gotta check this thing out. And I remember walking into the office on Red Hill and thinking, okay, this is home. This is the coolest place ever. Why would I ever leave? Cinematics department was created round about the time of Diablo 1. We set out to basically prove ourselves. We did the intro to Diablo 1. And at the time, it was pretty cool. I look back on it now and cringe, but I guess it was pretty cool. Hello, my friend. Stay a while and listen. The idea for Diablo really came from uh, the guys over at Condor, which eventually became Blizzard North. They were, they were a solid team, young like us, very good. Originally, Diablo was going to be a turn-based claymation role-playing game. And we said, well, we think the kind of the core of the idea is excellent, but let us show you what we're doing with 3D these days. And so we kind of redirected them from claymation to uh, 3D. Let's try to imagine what Diablo would have looked like if it were done with claymation. Diablo seemed uh, a little dark <laughs> to me, but by that time, I was not gonna question the Blizzard. I mean, we'd already had 
uh, two products, each which went number one. That wasn't a coincidence. With Warcraft 2, we offered uh, network play. And what happened was people wanted to be able to play it over the internet, but we hadn't actually provided facilities for that. So with uh, Diablo, we decided that we should be providing that ma matchmaking functionality. And that was really uh, where the original idea for Battle.net came from. We always talked about one button access. We wanted to be able to just push one button and be playing with your friends and to be simple and to not have to enter IP addresses and all kinds of stuff like that. A really easy way for people to find each other and share the gaming experiences that they wanted to play together. For us, it was a no-brainer because every day after work, you know, and during work, we'd be playing either Samurai Showdown or Street Fighter or Mortal Kombat, and there was just no more satisfying a feeling than whooping your friend versus whooping a computer AI. One of my claims to fame is I actually defeated Roman Kenny in Street Fighter II using my feet. And I would also make sure that after that game, anyone else who wanted to play me played with the foot controller. So they got my funk on their hands and they were kind of playing like, uh, uh. And so I would defeat them too. Defeat, look at that. So we had done Warcraft 2 and we were going to start working on a space-based RTS game. What geek amongst us, you know, didn't grow up wanting to work on Star Wars? You know, so StarCraft was uh, was an uh, opportunity to, you know, dig out a different kind of space opera. Yeah, it was just a whole bunch of us just throwing crazy ideas around until ultimately you had the Zerg and the Protoss and the cinematics department was just getting up off the ground. We knew we wanted to make cinematics. Thing was, there really was not a fleshed out story for the game yet. What we decided to do was create some pieces that could be used in a variety of ways. Matt and Dwayne had uh, already started working on the intro and things like that and doing pieces that they thought was going to really sell the, the Terrans as rednecks. What you got for me out there, Joey Ray? <laughs> we hit pay dirt this time for sure. We went through the sort of idea of, hey, why don't we put orcs in space and have it be orcs and humans except set in space? That was actually an idea we thought about. We had just taken the Warcraft 2 engine and created some new art, almost basically skinned Warcraft 2 for a science fiction theme. Brought it to a consumer electronics show and showed it off and everybody goes, oh yeah, orcs in space. Like, no, it's not orcs in space. It turns out at the time we were very proud of it, but by the time the end of the show rolled around, we were actually, I think, a little bit embarrassed. And really got our asses kicked. Uh, we saw what everybody else was doing and we realized very quickly that we had to change it. About a year into it, we completely scrapped the art and switched to a more advanced sort of isometric perspective, and it really took on a nice, clean, advanced look. I said, all right, give me a couple weeks, month, something like that. I'll do a whole new engine. Just lock me in a dark room. When I come out of the dark room, I'll have a new engine, and you can use that, make StarCraft. So that's what I did. Every day for a month leading up to December, I said, you know, at midnight to all 50 of us who were still there working seven days a week, don't worry, we're in the home stretch. Of course, we were nowhere near the home stretch. We thought we were gonna ship that game uh, in 1997, maybe even earlier than that if you think of when we started doing the Orcs in Space version. For the team, the crunch lasted for about eight months. And he kept telling us we were in the home stretch and we were days away. Well, months were passing and he kept telling us the same thing and for some reason we kept buying it. It didn't come out, I think, until April. But honestly, I look back on it um, rather fondly. I took off maybe 18 hours because that's how long it took for Garrett to be born. Garrett's my son. I have this feeling, you know, that that entire team was kind of in the zone. My wife slept on the couch while I laid my son, three days old, on a towel on my desk next to my keyboard. Really productive, really effective, doing a lot of great work, knowing we're, we were working on something really important. I'm sitting there, chick, 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 chick. here, have some, have a bottle. Chick, chick, chick. Just keep on working. And that was, you know, that was family time at Blizzard in the early days. That's how I dealt with family and crunch. It was just a really important project, um, something we could be proud of. When we first started working on World of Warcraft, it really was sort of the natural evolution of things. 
At the point that we decided to really do it, we were, uh, you know, already knee deep in the development of Warcraft 3. We kind of envisioned one day we would want to bring the universe of Warcraft to life in sort of a persistent universe game that you could be an individual character within this living, breathing world. It was a very organic thing to look at the, the world that was taking shape in terms of the Warcraft 3 product and really translating those ideas to a much more open-ended, um, real-time world. Uh, so in, in many ways, they were kind of co-developed. The team got behind it, and we started to, you know, figure out, well, wh how do we want to build this MMO? What, what do we want to do different? We wanted something that was a little more faster-paced action, less grind involved, so that uh, you're not sitting around waiting. You know, I remember when we first started on World of Warcraft, and it was this vast, rich, colorful world. And so to sit down and play it and be, and be really immersed in it and f to find it so compelling, uh, it definitely felt like something that was special. The first creature we made was called a fur bog. You would kill these fur bogs and they would drop a nipple ring, which was one of their treasures. The early dev development of WoW was awesome. Um, the team was pretty amazing. I remember for probably the first month that I joined, they called me FNG and I was so happy when we hired the next guy after me and I no longer had to be FNG. By the time we put out the original WoW, it was just one of those game worlds that really knew what it was. And I think that was part of the vibe that people experienced when they jumped into the product. They just felt like, ah, just every rock feels like it's placed with love and care. Typically in game development, when you put a placeholder model in, you put like just a checkerboarded box. It's obvious that this is not the right model. Well, um, somebody had the bright idea that if they took a picture of me and put it on that cube, that that would be better because then obviously I would see that and it would it would uh, encourage me to get the artist to fix that piece of artwork. And so the first bug we got in our alpha was, why is Billy Joel looking at me? And why is Ponch from Chips on my shoulder or whatever? You know, his shoulder pad was missing and so there was a cube of me on his shoulder. Yeah, that's the story of the Shane cube. We can make our orcs into heroes. We can have goblins flying around on jetpacks. I mean, it's a big, goofy, free universe of infinite possibility. By the end of the project, we had 60 people on the team. Uh, and we, it took us five years to make. Uh, we crunched a lot. The team crunched um, much longer than we probably should have. Because it was pretty harsh. We crunched for like two years at the end there. But I think we all felt like not only how we poured blood, sweat, and tears into the game, but it was as great as it possibly could be. World of Warcraft really has taken on a life of its own in terms of the, the scope and scale and the size of the community. But nobody really appreciated um, how transformational that game would be uh, to the organization in terms of what it took to operate a game like that. There's just countless things that we, that we had to learn and that we never had experienced really at this scale um, prior to launching WoW. It's been a life changer and a, a company changer, a game changer, an industry changer. I mean, we had capacity plans for the first year for World of Warcraft of somewhere in the neighborhood of 400,000 in North America. And we blew through that capacity in the first month. We had to actually stop shipping boxes multiple times to retail during the first year because we didn't have the capacity to support the players. And so there was this mad scramble to try to get more equipment and try to make sure that the experience for the users were really well. So it was it was nothing that we could have even fathomed to you know plan for ahead of time. Every single department was affected when we launched World of Warcraft and had to deal with the um, massive amount of success, the number of players that came in. And so uh, we really had to scale up the entire business and we were frantically trying to ship patches for the game um, with an understaffed development team and I remember some of the first people to join team two were some of the most inspirational people to get on the team because they so loved what we were doing uh, that's when J. Allen Brack joined the team I was the brought in to be the senior producer uh, for the art team been a huge fan of Blizzard for all the way since back in the Warcraft 1 days, played a lot of multiplayer Warcraft 1, a lot of Warcraft 2. There was such energy uh, that these people were bringing that they kind of brought the message with them. Do you guys realize how awesome the game you made is? I feel like all of the new talent brought life back to WoW after we were sitting there licking our wounds after the rough launch. Even back then, even when we blew through our capacity in the first month for our first year, I don't think that any of us had any idea that we would be hitting the, the 1 million active player mark, the 2 million 
active player mark, the 5 million active player mark, and then to have surpassed a 10 million active player mark was uh, far and away beyond, I think, almost everyone's expectations. The lore story of Adham saying, one day this game will have one million subscribers, and everyone just, <laughs> that'll never happen. If there's anything that, uh, that we've learned in our time here, it's that we're not great at predicting the future. I really have to hand it to uh, the people who uh, helped us build that game into the game that it is today because it really took a lot of hard work, it took a lot of commitment, and it just didn't happen by accident. It happened because the people here at Blizzard made that happen. I think it shocked and surprised people. It changed the way people thought of things. It changed the social aspects of gaming and took it to an entirely different level. I think we've done something that, that is uh, going to be hard to match, and I think candidly will potentially only be matched by our next big MMO. Hey, my name is Chris Sigety. I'm production director on StarCraft II. My first job here was in QA. I was actually going to college at the time, wanted a summer job, and what brought me to Blizzard was gaming. So StarCraft II was a, a huge undertaking, and, and the first step in it was figuring out that we wanted to do StarCraft II. It, it took 12 years between the time we released the first StarCraft and got around to start delivering StarCraft II. Oh yeah, when did we start in StarCraft? Um, what was it, seven years ago? What? Seven? Um, what I remember about it is the leadership at that time sat around and decided, yes, we're going to make StarCraft II, and I still think I have this document, which was, um, okay, we're going to make StarCraft II. What is StarCraft II? StarCraft II is going to hearken to the legacy. It's going to largely feel like and play like the original game in 3D, of course. And then we're going to do something really cool with single player, and we're going to do something really cool with the online service. You know, storytelling is a really important component of all the games that we make also. With StarCraft II, we recognized that that was going to be important, um, and and we really built on that, that whole flexible storytelling experience. The team is fantastic. We've got really a very strong personality helping ch lead this the team, which is Sammy, and he's got just such a great ability to influence people in a, in a very positive manner. You had to have a real dedication to, to rise up before the crack of noon and, and show yourselves, and that's difficult. As you all know, all artists are designers, so we can also design our own games. <laughs> Um, but we have designers here now to help us out. Well, I started out, you know, working um, for Rob uh, Pardo on StarCraft, and we did, you know, the stuff on units and structures. We got to um, work on missions uh, and this sort of thing. And then I got a chance to sort of take over more of a leadership role on uh, StarCraft II. And um, we hired a bunch of guys, put together a balanced team, um, and really started trying to put the game together. I wrote the AI for everything, actually, StarCraft One. Um, a lot of two have always been looking for ways to make the computer not cheat. In StarCraft II, we've completely eliminated all forms of cheating, all forms of effective cheating. You cannot tell the difference between a human and the computer anymore. We were trying to remake this classic game that we've all been playing, you know, off and on for 10 different years now, and I think there was a lot of legitimate fear and dread uh, on the development team that we could accomplish this task, that we could actually make a game that was hopefully worthy uh, of the StarCraft name. One of the best PC games of all time, probably the best strategy game of all time. When we when we started on StarCraft and released it, I think everybody knew it was a fun game and, and had high hopes for it. I'm really proud of what we delivered from a storytelling experience for StarCraft II. And, you know, the multiplayer experience is awesome as well, and the battle night experience is awesome as well. To see how far StarCraft went was really incredible. Blizzard is turning 20 years old, and at this point in a company's history, you, know, you really start looking at not only what's come in the past, but what is going to be Blizzard's legacy. The future. The future is big. 20 years is a long time, but I, I think we want Blizzard to persist long after uh, the leadership that's currently in charge is gone. And, you know, if you look at a company like Disney as an example, Disney's been around for 80 years. 20 years in, they haven't even invented half their best films or hadn't even done Disneyland yet. 
So you think about from that standpoint, I think that our best days are still ahead of us and we still have our, our golden age ahead of us. Our goal to be a company that does the most incredible gaming experiences, that develops those and creates those, is something that's part of our DNA that we're going to continue with for a long time to come. Things weren't always the way they are now. Actually, things were quite different 15 years ago and they've evolved to be the way that they are now. And we're still evolving. And so it's not like this static thing that is Blizzard Entertainment. It's a very dynamic, growing, evolving thing. Everyone here truly loves these products. It's a big deal. You know, how many companies in the world, you know, you go to work, you have a great job, you, you know, you pay the bills. I don't know how many places there are out there where people truly believe in what they're doing. That many places that truly engender the level of, of, of pride um, that you associate, you know, with that, with that logo, you know, that little blue logo. It means a lot to me. As long as they have good people who are focused and dedicated to making the very, very best games um, with that experience that others can't deliver, they're going to do extremely well. You know, I think that um, our pipeline at Blizzard, the, the games that we're working on, I think are really awesome. I think that uh, we're still uh, positioned better than any other company. Um, to be a leader in online games globally. We get to be at the forefront of a new entertainment medium. With games, you know, we have the opportunity to have new game mechanic paradigms or new technology or the ability to link up thousands of players. And it's, it's just super exciting to be able to, you know, really offer whole new ways to interact with entertainment. After all of the change that has occurred in our company and all the growth, um, the globalization, it's a, it's a very different kind of company these days as it was, um, you know, way back in the day. The growth and complexity and scale of the games we're making, that has been outpaced by the number of people around the world that are interested in playing our games. A big part of what Blizzard wants to do is, is to make our great games available to as many people around the world as possible. I think one of the things that's really cool in our offices around the world is the amazing amount of diversity that we have uh, with the people there, but who, have, who sh all share the passion around the products and who love the Blizzard culture. With sort of the dominance of World of Warcraft, Blizzard might have a tendency to kind of want to defend that franchise for as long as possible. I know that there's other things in the works, and I think that that's excellent. I think that that team should go straight at World of Warcraft, trying to take every customer that World of Warcraft had. Because if we don't, somebody else will. You know, I think it's more important than ever that all of us that have been at Blizzard for a long time, that we really take the time and talk to the new employees and teach them about our culture, teach them about our values and tribal knowledge, and, and make sure that we stay Blizzard. Teaching the next generation of employees to, to, to understand that that is important and that those values do really go to the heart of the people that have been here forever. That is the foundation for Blizzard in the past, the Blizzard today, and, and Blizzard in the future. As long as we remember what our, where our foundation is and, and what's made us successful to this point and keep that in mind in everything that we're doing, then you know, definitely the future of Blizzard uh, can be very bright.